Once again, I would like to thank you for creating a space for such a webinar because we are having an epidemic and pandemic of webinars these days. So it is one different one, which is going to make a difference for all the younger doctors, especially, and also the senior doctors. Whenever we talk about writing a paper, uh, one would generally say your, your mentors have been teaching you publish or perish. And that sounds very negative. So I have changed it to publish and flourish. It's one way of living your life. And uh, towards the end of my presentation, I would also like to share with you my ignorance on how do I make a presentation? Because there's no one correct way of doing it. If you listen to somebody, you just like him, not because of the number of slides and the quality of slides. You just listen because you want to hear the same thing. So often it is a story of what you wanted to read, you're reading, so you like it. And what you wanted to hear, you hear and you like it. So the entire concept of writing a paper, having conducted this 40 years old, now nearly about 70 workshops by now, including the Royal College workshops and also American College workshops, I realize it is very much a flexible, fluid way of learning about writing. And writing should be a passion and all of us are good writers. We always, I mean, we have probably forgotten the era when we were writing letters to our parents or parents were writing to us or we were writing to our children, et cetera, et cetera, because the letter writing has disappeared. We are into a WhatsApp age. So many things have changed. Therefore, it's not a bad idea to revisit the whole idea all over again. And I would therefore once again thank Dr. Bora and Dr. Das for organizing such a workshop and inviting me over to just share my ignorance on the talk. On the, on the topic. Well, this is a beautiful writer by uh, Francis Bacon, and I hope you would have a good time for the next hour. This is what we're looking at. Reading makes a full man, conference a ready man, and writing an exact man. So in the order, reading is a good habit. Conference, great habit, but writing is actually the ultimate uh, litmus test for what you think, whether it is peer reviewed, whether it's heard or learnt. And on the same basis, I, I mentioned in the beginning, why should you write firstly? This is the first question that comes to your mind. And I'm going to address my talk on the same lines. Why, how, and then what, and what not. That is also very important. Publish or perish? Well, I've converted it to publish and flourish, and I wrote it in a couple of journals as editorial also. The easiest thing to do on earth is not write. This is William Goldman. You'll keep finding these quotes coming from authors. Who... Mm. Huh? The easiest thing on the earth is not to write. John. Right. So, <laughs> sorry. So, um, why should I write? Continues. Writing is an obligation, friends. If you don't write it, you have not done it. If you didn't publish, you didn't do it. If Dr. Bora says I've done 1,000 endoscopies, but if he has not published it, he has done none. It is mandatory. And writing is an obligation for all of us. Unless we write, how do we pass it on to the next generation? And how do we know what we are writing? Because you would be very surprised after 10 years when, I look, when you look back at your own letters or when you look back at your own publications, you are surprised I did this. I didn't know that. It has changed so much now. So you see, as you evolve, your writing evolves because your thoughts change. It sharpens your critical thinking and it's mandatory for a scientific oral hygiene. I have a submission to make here and also a disclaimer. And that is my preparation of the presentation, as you would see, would be partly the answer to the question, how do I prepare my PowerPoint? So that will save time. So I'll follow the formula of six by six, et cetera. So you can watch it and towards the end, I'll continue. Now, this is, uh, if you're interested, was an editorial that I did some years ago, uh, Publish, Flourish, or Perish. And it is something that you would find interesting if you read. So why, do people don't, why don't people publish? Why is it that they don't publish? Usually, they're scared of the inferior outcomes. They think 
if we write something, we'll be noticed for not writing well. And the pressures of performing, yeah, they're so busy doing their clinical work, or shall I say, <laughs> uh, making money, that they don't find time to do it. So it's important. Now let's start, therefore, how do you get started? So I'm going to address the problem for the younger surgeons, for the middle group, and also for the people who have not yet started writing. It's never too late. Scariest thing is always just before you start writing. After that, things can only get better. So first thing that you must do is start. Maybe you start today by doing what we'll discuss in the interactive session if you have at the end. The whole idea is don't procrastinate just start. So don't be lazy about it and don't lie back and just feel good about one surgery that you did. Feel better by writing about it, even if it is not the best thing that you possibly thought you could have done. Therefore comes the term writer's block and you have heard of it many times. In fact, I delivered a couple of times this talk in the ASI SECON meetings also when I was conducting their PG master classes, which I started way back in the Coimbatore 2 conference, which are still continuing. It's good to see that happening. Now, the writer's block is a fear of failure. I think writer's block is simply the dread that you're going to write something horrible. But as a writer, I believe that if you sit down long enough, sooner or later, something will come out. Do you know the top most authors have also had writer's block? They also stopped writing at some point of time. If you visit Rachi, and uh, there's a place called Tagore Hills, it is believed that Tagore visited that place to restart writing on something because you need some inspiration somewhere. And actually, Charles Dickens, Shakespeare, all of them had writer's block. So there's nothing like a writer's block and the fear of failure is intoxicating. So you have to get out of it and I'll make an effort. Therefore, I'm glad I have an hour with you to try to take that fear out so that those who have not started or those who had started and have stopped, I will share with you, I was doing the interviews for a a premier institution four days back for four days for professors, for associate professors, etc. The only corner which was lying empty was publications. And the only reason they gave was we just felt lazy about it or we didn't think it was necessary or we thought we are so busy with our clinical work. Everybody's busy. And do you know, most busy people do more things. Now, uh, going further, <clears throat> how would you beat this block? I'm going to share with you as, as I did, I'm going to share with you. So it's not going to be a theoretical talk. So you'll find practical answers to some of the queries that you would have. Begin in the middle or begin wherever you like it. So most of us get stuck, I'll tell you how. We start with the title and we are stuck. We don't know what all to write. And we keep beating around it and we're too tired to continue and we leave it. Once we are done with the titles, we come to the authors. HOD's name, vice chancellor's name, his name, her name, etc. We get stuck again, we lose it. And actually, we never progress. Then we come to introduction, we are lost again. No, it is finally as the title appears. Do you know a lot of films, including the very famous, uh, the not, not only Ten Commandments, but it's also Ben Hur, one of my all time favorite movies. A lot of scenes were done, which were climax scenes were done before the actual film happened, because you would never know that it was done backwards when the scenes are put in that order. So the reader will never know that the, it was all written backwards. Only you will know. So start where you like it. Most of us like writing about something. We write about it. If you write, like the climax, write the climax first. Now, this is uh, another uh, interesting article, if you're interested. Uh, Challenges in writing, the writer's block, which I did some years ago. It's a link for those who want to read it further. So this would actually indicate as to why uh, the writer's block happens and what can we do to break it. Now, where do we start? Let's start from where it starts. That is research question. You must have a question in your mind. Otherwise, why, you, why should you find an answer? So it starts with the research question and research question is the, gives birth to the review of literature. You keep searching around. Sometimes you ask a question as to what is life? Who am I? These questions, where do you go and find the answers? Like just now you heard Astoma Sadgamaya, Tamsorma Jyotir Gamaya. So you go back to Upanishads. This is from this is a hymn from Upanishad. So you go back and search. So what is that? A reviewing of literature. If only we knew what we know, that would be the end of it. Most of us actually don't know what we already know. So there's no question of finding out what we don't know. So first thing is reviewing the literature, right? And for that, 
You're all taught this in your undergraduate days, also in postgraduate times, or for all those who are interested in writing publications, levels of evidence. And you keep hearing the level of evidence, level one evidence today, bilateral hernia repair, you can do laparoscopic repair. Now, otherwise open lictin stint, mesh hernioplasty. So there are gold standards. So level one evidence is basically a robust randomized control trial. And we know that randomized control trial is where you actually have one variable which is different and you compare the two arms. The well-conducted and a robust randomized control trial is the best way to get good evidence. Meta-analysis, which is nothing but after. Meta means after. Metaphysics, you know, Einstein's metaphysics. So meta-analysis is once you've got a lot of randomized control trials together, I will put them together and have another research question and I'll then organize them and find answers. That's an even stronger evidence. And systematic review includes both. But when I say randomized control trials, they are not always possible. You do, do you know there was never any randomized control trial for laparoscopic cholecystectomy, but it has already become a gold standard. How did it become a gold standard? You cannot have a randomized control trial for parachutes. I mean, you can't throw 50 people without parachutes on the plane and 50 with parachutes to know how many will die. If I can ask you to guess, you will say 50, which again would be wrong because it will be more than 50 because some would die of fright also, even with parachute. So what I'm trying to say is it is not always possible to do randomized control trials, but wherever possible, that's the best evidence and you should know about it. Now, cohort studies are those which, are, which go forward where nothing has happened, case control go backwards, where even says already, I mean, you have, they have happened and you're tracing backwards. Case report and case series are level four evidence. They don't matter much. And my, when I was editor-in-chief of Indian Journal of Surgery, I used to get lots of complaints from the members that our case report doesn't get published. But do you know, case reports never get published in most good journals because they don't get citation. And if they don't get citation, the journal won't get the Im impact factor. And we got the Indian Journal of Surgery indexed at that time based on impact factor only. So that's very, very important. And expert opinion is useful of good and the great. I mean, I could see some very, very eminent surgeons in the crowd here. And um, they have great views about things, but they are level five evidence. And finally, the anecdote, me, we, she, he, I do it. I do it this way, so you bloody well do it that way. Wrong way to learn, wrong way to teach. So every teacher is today obliged to teach his students based on evidence. We have moved on from eminence-based surgery to evidence-based surgery where you must provide evidence for everything. So this was just to give a detour of how do you rate your review of literature, which is a primary thing. So what, I, what did I say? Research question, then review of literature. Now you basically have decided you're writing a paper and we are doing it together. So it's like a recipe. You've got the ingredients, you put it together, the test of a pudding lies in its taste. And finally, the approval is done by editor in chief. So if it is good, it will be approved. If it's not good, it will be rejected. Writing a paper, contents. Basically, the contents of a paper, if I am the, since I review so many journals even today, results section and the materials and methods are seen first because that's where lies what you did. It is the bottom line of what you're actually trying to do. If you know that, you will then build it on a language. You will then have figures and tables. Then you will add literature in the form of introduction and discussion, and you'll then choose a journal which suits your article, and then you will prepare your first draft. That's your taste. You know, you taste your pudding. How does it taste? So that's the first draft, and that's how you prepare it. Now, this is the journal organization. You're taught this Imrod pattern. You are asked this question also in the exams, postgraduate. But don't get stuck in this order. I never follow this, so I'll be very honest with you. And in fact, I've written uh, a letter to the editor of the British Medical Journal, where I wrote that Imrad pattern is not possible all the time. It's not the most useful way to do it. Anyway, that's one way of looking at it. And what I'm going to share with you is also one correct way of doing it. This is not the only way of doing it. The order is title and abstract. That is usually the first in your uh, paper, but that's the last to write. Please pay attention. Introduction is the second last to write. Methods, first to write. Results, first to write, because that's something you did. And you can write it easily. Like, I collected 30 patients. I checked for this, this, this. Then I found this, this, this. 
so many were locally advanced breast cancers so many were early breast cancers so many were metastatic breast cancers so you know you you that's your field and then you come to discussion and conclusion and references but do remember title is the last uh i've lost my slides can you is my slide visible hello no sir they're not visible sir. No, sir. No, sir. i don't know what happened i didn't do anything i'll just do it again Jay. yeah yeah so we can stop as stop sharing again come back yeah it's a new share i don't know somebody shared it okay stop share and then new okay i'll do that again i'm sorry about that in the presentation first sir then click on share screen what do i uh, do i stop sharing i've done that now open your ppt first sir no my ppt what happened actually uh i'll just click the one okay my ppt is open now then you please click on share screen and select your ppt yeah that i'll do but uh, anyway now can you see my ppt yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh. it's coming back so um, i'm sorry about that now this is uh, uh, then the way that you should be organizing it and moving it and uh, now knowing your readership you have already done your write up and now you're preparing your manuscript you must know who you're writing for if you send a surgical article to a gynae journal unless it has got some gynecological relevance it will be rejected and also read the kind of articles that are already there must adopt to the style and level of writing especially which is appropriate for that readership if there is a paper on molecular genetics like big glycoprotein in breast cancer i would like to send it to a cancer journal and that to to a molecular um, uh, sciences journal the the best way to do do that i'm giving you these tips also is to read the instructions for authors thoroughly but importantly read some good papers from that journal so you will understand as to what are they expected and what is expected of you now that you have decided comes then comes the writing part of it basic grammar and writing is the author's responsibility although these days you have the language experts who can guide you and help you but that doesn't work and remember we all have our mother tongue which is different from english it's possible that it is english for some but for a lot of people and we think in that language isn't it so when we think in that language whatever we want to write we translate into english and write it and remember scientific english is a foreign language even for native speakers i used to assist a very eminent journal uh, editor in chief of british journal of cancer and european journal of surgical oncology and one day he told me chins you indians write a very difficult english he is a british so i asked him how is how is that possible he said because you probably in the colonial era learned to write the victorian english which is not read these days so we are very used to writing a bureaucratic english which is not what is really required and to sound more technical you use very difficult words it's not necessary no editor having been editor in chief for 6 years for the indian of surgery and for more than 8 years for the surgical oncology journal i don't see any reason to reject a paper simply because the english is not too, too good it should be should be too bad like we i used to reject all chinese spanish and the portuguese or also the egyptian journals uh, articles which are very very bad english but by and large you you cannot be so bad so it should be no that fear should go out of the mind and do not please use word processors and spell checkers as standard writing tools which you people are using these days and uh, i am giving you a living example i use this for protocol workshops which i do in my institution and elsewhere this is the proper this is actual translation of google writing this is what dr google did <coughs> when in rome do as the romans this is what was in english and the hindi translation is rome mein ho to romeo ki tarah karo that is not correct so do not use the google translation it can really make a mess of it <laughs> <laughs> now you are ready and you have prepared it and you've got the first draft ready and i call it here the pds the perfect draft syndrome 
what it does is you write each time and you delete it each time. You say, oh, it's not good. Then you write and you read, read you and again delete it. Well, don't do it too, so frequently. Most people's first drafts are terrible. And don't be shocked at it. Your first paper is not going to fetch your Nobel Prize. So write what you can and enjoy what you write. Good writing is actually rewriting. Don't delete it, just improve it. What do I do? I would leave any write-up on a desktop. Then I'll go for my walk or my game of tennis. And once I'm back from it, I look at it, I suddenly realize, oh, how could I write such a rubbish um, uh, paragraph? I can improve it. It'll change. And after a few uh, days, it'll get all right. Don't, don't keep doing it forever because you'll never be able to publish it. The serious effort at editing, rewriting, and fine-tuning is mandatory before you send it. Now, it is also advised that you show it to your mentor, who should be able to guide you better. Now I'm ready, and I'm going to teach you about the algorithmic approach to first draft. When I say I teach you, please don't get me wrong. You all know it. I'm just going to just share what you already know, and that's what is necessary in any class. Create an outline. Don't just sleep over it. Have a web, web diagram. This is my outline. <coughs> Keep the introduction as a second last thing. But I have not thought about title as of. Don't think of title, and I'll give you examples at the end why. Begin with methods, which is the easiest part to write, followed by results section. Write the initial draft, whatever it is, good, bad, ugly. Don't bother. Write it. Write. Resist temptation to correct and edit and edit and edit. Don't do that. And don't bother about producing the best draft in the first attempt. Nobody has ever been able to do it. You won't also be able to do it, and you should not be ashamed of it. Now, the major issues that I observe, I cannot condense a five hours workshop in one hour, but I've taken out some important points, and therefore I'm giving summary of a few things. This is an example given. I don't use more than five lines in my slides. But here you see more because I've given two examples in one, otherwise they don't make sense. Most of us abuse word forms very commonly, conveying the meaning as clearly as simply as possible. Like you see the comparison here, the first one, the low rate of encounters was the reflection of population density reductions. While the same can be written, the low rate of encounters reflects uh, reduced population density. So you can make it simpler. That's what editing I'm talking about. More words where few will do. It's another mistake. You try to, we try to use lots of words, very technical, difficult words, which sound scientific and academic, while the message is simple. Long words like utilization, use, simple. In order to, I shouldn't have said, in order to be able to talk to you, I should be trying to do what I can do. No, that's the, I can put it simply across. To make it simple, I'll speak to you. That is how it goes. Avoiding special words to sound more technical, scientific, academic, the, when the, most, the message is more easily presented. Don't have to do that. Clarity, not elegance, is what makes good writing. Please understand this. I am sharing with you what is shared by a lot of people. Clarity, just be clear on what you're saying. If you can say it simply, I observe 100 hernia, hernia patients following like instant tension, premature aneuploplasty, and I observed that the recurrence rates is 2%. Finished. So in order to find out the recurrence rates in 100 patients, we observed about, uh, we observed the, 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 the 100, sorry, the 100 patients of hernia, the aneuploplasty, and we found that, see, it gets a long, long story, which nobody wants to read these days. Avoid jargon and acronyms. These are usually the cause for rejection by the editor because he, he finds it very annoying. Be specific, concrete, not abstract. And actually the bottom line in each slide is going to be important. So I'll request especially the other colleagues to just focus on the bottom line. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Don't try to beat around the bush. Just get into the bush. There is no point talking around and round and round. It doesn't help. Now, this is a beautiful slide. I share it in all my presentations. It is from, uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, um, it's the bottom line of how articles get rejected. Now, this is from BMJ. And actually, the observation, this is from World Medical Education, uh, the Editors uh, uh, Association. Poorly written, excessive jargon. You can see this is the cutoff for the most frequent cause of rejection. This is occasional, 
Blue is seldom. The violet is seldom. Now, the red is excessive jargon and poorly written. That's where they get rejected. Inadequate and in, inappropriate presentation, poor description of design. These are the reasons. The others are not so important. So that's what I was trying to highlight. The fourth point, use an outline to organize your ideas. You know, it's good that you all, all just outline what you want to say. You have four points, just outline four points. Don't try to speak, write too much. They, they, therefore, your tasks are basically three and you put them in major headings so that the editor finds it interesting. He also is going to read only for that much time. He can't spend the time you have spent writing it. He will just be reading it. Figuring out what is to be said is the first thing. What do you want to say? Then planning order and logic of argument. Don't try to start with the planning first. And crafting the exact language is the last thing to do. Don't just start with difficult jargons to in the beginning. So just figure out what you want to say. Plan the order and logic. And then craft the exact language. That is the last thing to do. Don't start with how well I write. I copy one article which is written in British Journal of Surgery. That's not the way to go about it. Write the, your way. And it's going to be definitely appreciated. Next, structure of paragraphs. You've got a sentence written. Everybody can write a good sentence. And let me assure you, paragraphs are a problem. These days we have the plagiarism um, um, softwares. But in the earlier days, we were judging the quality and the copying and the plagiarism in articles by reading the paragraphs. Most people shoehorn ideas if you're copying from some article. It was very easy to catch it. You have a beautiful paragraph which has got the best English that you can think of, followed by an awful one, and you know which one is yours. So that's where you get caught, that you copied the first one. So do not, do not, do not try to write unnecessary things by just shoehorning ideas, as they call it. Shoehorning an idea is not a great thing uh, to do. Should begin with the topic sentence and set the, that sets the stage clearly for what will follow. Topic sentences should be short and direct. Paragraph from ideas, introduction, topic sentence with flow. Once on top of every paragraph, the topic sentence should come. And then you can flow down. Because what are you trying to do actually should be visible all the time. <clears throat> I don't think I need to say this, but this is a common problem. And you would observe it, all of your eminent teachers, a lot of you, you must be checking thesis and you find that in the thesis, at least I found it and I pointed it out to many, many, uh, especially the surgical oncology thesis these days that I check. Um, they continue to write in the uh, future tense reason. When they wrote their protocol, they wrote, we will do this, then we will do that, then we will do this, then we will do that. And in the thesis, they write the same. You've already done it. So you'll have to write everything in past tense. So the entire paper is written in past tense. You, there's nothing you're going to do now. You've already done it. But you'll be surprised. It's good about 15 to 20% of papers that we get for the journal. We will do this, then we'll do that, then we'll do this, then we'll do that. You've already done it. For example, data has already been collected. And be careful in using the terms might and may, and may, may will and would. <coughs> Excuse me. As I said, English is a funny language, but it is a simple one too. Don't use where you can do with simple ones. Stick to will and would, but stick to one. It's actually a way of weaseling out of making a clear statement. When you don't want to make a clear statement, if you watch, yes, minister, yes, prime minister, uh, the Humphrey there will use the bureaucratic language to confuse, and he'll be supported by Bernard, who's the secretary to the prime minister. And they keep speaking in that you know, the weather today is not so bad as it used to be. And then at the same time, the fog has got a little better, but it's worse than day for yesterday. So you are not able to say that the weather is bad. So that is not what is to be done in a paper. You write direct words. In that case, I can, I think, crudely use it. I am um, being, I mean, uh, in, I'm associated with the Royal College. I'm presently also the International Surgical Advisor for the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. And I'm also the governor and president for the American College of Surgeons. So I can tell you both sides of it. The American English is more direct, more useful. You can write it simply. Captions for all your tables or figures. I have seen it, and you must have seen it too, that they get repeated in your text. They don't need to be repeated. The caption should contain sufficient information, and you don't need to write it in the text. Writing captions, when, when you, when you, if you put all these captions together, and you can write the result section. Say if I have 10 tables, I'll write their captions nicely. And I take the captions, copy them, and paste them in the results section. That's what we have done. 
So what does that do? When the result section is to be written, I can build my text around it. That's one smart way of doing it. When citing a reference, focus on the ideas, not the authors. I have to say something here. The middle part can be a little draggish, but enjoy it. Literature citation should be parenthetical. I mean, parenthetical means what? This you should not mention. Those days are gone. You all read it. Marx et al. found this. Then Lenin et al. found that. This is not done anymore. We don't have to write it. In the Vancouver style, you put them at the end. Just write the reference and that goes to the your references list. So do not write that so-and-so said it unless it is Isaac Newton you're talking about or we're talking about Shushuta. These people you won't have references on. So you would put the name here. Otherwise, the references have to come. It's no longer written. I've given examples of all. Marx found this. This is not done anymore. Finally, you're down to the writing part. Show, don't tell. Don't just tell them. You have shown it, they will know. Rather than the result is interesting or significant, show how it is interesting or significant. Giving an example, rather than the large difference in the mean tumor size between population C and population D was particularly interesting. You can simply write, which will sound more scientific, Mean tumor size is generally varied amongst the populations by only a few centimeters. But the size in population C and D differed by 25 millimeters. So you're given evidence, let him find out whether it's interesting or not. You don't have to tell him that it is interesting. You're down to results and then comes discussion. So results and discussion are different. Do not make them one. But some journals have results and discussion together. And a lot of us continue to write them together. But most journals have got them separated. Results are logical derivation from the data. So if you have a data, that's the results. You just write what you have got. And do not discuss here why it has happened. Just indicate it here. So you, when you get into discussion, you will describe it. Now, when you're writing it, just for every section, I'm giving you two slides so that I'm able to cover all aspects. I mean, decide on the elements of, uh, you know, based on importance. You don't, uh, you don't just copy paste the elements of the story, then choose the subset of text, figures, and tables that most effectively and concisely convey the message. And then organize them later on in the sequence to tell the story. What do you do about figures, pictures? Remember, each must have one important take home message at least. Don't just put 10 pictures for the same thing. They're annoying, they're not allowed, they charge for it. And in print journals, print pictures, you're paying. So ideally, when I look at the picture in 30 seconds, I should be able to understand what you're trying to say. That's the simple way to do it. I mean, you should be able to understand in nearly 30 to 40 seconds, what does the picture convey? And there should be enough important take home in each picture, don't put them just there. So finally, the result section is done. Writing results section is the best way to discover the analysis and figures that then you can subsequently build on it. And that is how you need to get down to discussion. Now, discussion is something that you think the editor is going to read immediately. He will read it at the end. He would have read your abstract, definitely, but he'll look at your, a good, smart reviewer reads your results. Discussion starts again with the research question that you had. What is a research question? Research question is always a question. And when I mentioned about review of literature, I mentioned about research question. What is the question? Is it safe and cost effective to do laparoscopic hernia repairs in a setting of a rural healthcare center? That's your question. What did you find? It is safe to perform, but it is cost effective, but not safe to perform. What are its implications? So the take home can be that laparoscopic hernia repair can be offered safely and cost effectively, even in a rural center. The limitations, the rural center has its limitations in case of CBD injuries, Oh, sorry, the injuries to the, uh, uh, in the triangle of doom or trapezoid of disaster or what have you, wherever. 
the complications management can be a challenge. The negative findings. Cost was cut corners were done, cutting the size of the mesh or using the same instrument twice, which would mean that I may cause infections, which may not be ethically acceptable. So this was not subjected to rigorous ethical review. So that's a negative finding. What is the further research required? Can rural centers also be in coordinating with institutions in the main city to get their ethical clearance and institutional review board assessment? That's the research and you can write it, build on it. When you are writing the discussion, the strategies always write short sentences and start with a restatement of the important points of what you found, which I've just told you. Using this to set up ideas one wants to focus on in interpreting results and replacing them, in writing them in the, or relating with them in the literature. And then use subheadings, like in this case, if I'm doing, is breast conservation surgery feasible in a rural setup? Same question, that's a question. I went about doing that work and I found out the limitations. There is no frozen section facility available. Now the limitations. Now I've got all that background and now I'm putting it together. So use subheadings to describe it. Some journals may have a combined result and discussion, which I've already told you. Now at the end, the last paragraph should be, is the research question answered? Yes or no? Is it, if not answered, inferences from data that you, that you, that uh, requires discussion and comparing then the results with the existing literature and then interpretation of your hypothesis. My hypothesis was it is feasible to answer that research question by performing a particular design of study. And I find at the end, yes, it worked. And my hypothesis was correct. The research question was correctly answered. The flip side, breast conservation surgery was not possible in the rural setup because we don't have early breast cancers there. We don't have the screening program running. We don't have the frozen section. We don't have the expertise. We don't have the facility for central node biopsy. We don't have the facility for whatever. And then you can interpret. There's no shame in publishing a negative paper. Let me tell you, most journals want now negative findings also. It could not be done. Most of us teach our students, thesis should not have a negative result. I teach my students, if you get a negative finding, let's publish it. Because we found that it's not useful for Indian scenario. So it is not useful. Screening, is it good for Indian patients? Screening mammography, it is not good. We know that. Because our average tumor size is more than four centimeters. We need it to be less than two centimeters for screening. So you can interpret your hypothesis. Finally, you conclude. I'm talking about the paper. State answer to the research question. Did we get an answer? State it. Recommendations and numbered format is better. Don't write a paragraph. Conclusion should be in bulleted points. And then you can write answer to the research question. Did I get it? Yes or no. Recommendations. I didn't get it because my sample size was small. So it should be more sample size next time. And I did not apply the right formula to calculate the sample size which is there in uh, all of our literature that we know. And then you can write based on conclusion, the recommendations. Do you know now I've come to introductions, abstract and conclusion. We, a lot of our friends start with this, which is a mistake. And I'll tell you why, even I used to start with that. So I've, how did it change? I'll tell you. Introduction is the difficult to it because it's difficult to now craft balance of general context and specific focus. Because once you finish your work, many things change you realize I'm not finding the result that I was looking at and the paper doesn't look interesting based on what I'm writing because my findings are kept becoming more interesting. I'll share with you a couple of papers. There are many where I had to change my title towards the end to get it accepted and to be more readable. It may need substantial modification. And the hardest part to write is the introduction because introduction is not a short discussion, a common mistake that people do. Introduction is introducing the disease, then your topic, then the you know, the, the whole idea that you're going for. An abstract is the second last thing that I would like to write and therefore don't rush into it. The title is the last. Now I know what to write. Otherwise you would think I should have started with the title like we always do. It's not true because the title would change and the title can change and become more catchy and more attractive once you find the results. We did a study on apoptotic markers in breast cancers and I was going to publish. By that time, I'd published good about 15 biomarkers in breast cancer and other cancers. And I realized sending another biomarker, which was apoptotic markers, BCL2 BACS ratio, 
I thought that the, the editor, editor may find it a repetition. No, there's nothing great about it. So what? You found another uh, biomarker. It has changed nothing. But in the same article, I found that toxicity was correlating with response assessment in your, to New York June chemotherapy. So I created a new thing out of it. And I put toxicity as, as a predictor. I also put apoptotic markers there. But I changed the title to toxicity. And you would find a difference. It, it got published in one of the uh, top most impact factor journals because it was new and it made sense. Never have more than 15 words, which doesn't mean that you cannot have 16, uh, but don't make it a long text. The title should have three parts covered, each title, purpose, scope, and the methods. They should be there in the title. Sometimes we deviate from it. Like you know, friends, always learn one correct way of doing anything. There are 100 ways to reach Rome as long as you reach there and you reach alive. There are 100 ways to skin a cat. We know that. So there is no one only way. Always is always wrong in science and never is never right. So what you've learned is right. I'm just sharing one. Now, you learn your driving from driving instructor, but you modify it to suit your personality. You drive with one hand, then with the left, some drive with right. Others do it with one leaning one side. Learn one correct way of doing it, then modify it. If you learn a modified technique, then you would not be able to modify it to suit your personality. This is that paper I was referring to. Is drug to induced toxicity a good predictor of response to neurogen chemotherapy in patients with breast cancer? It was not going to be the title, but we observed. And in fact, the credit for this goes to both of these postgraduates of mine. This was long back. I just shared it with you because this title was initially we were working on are apoptotic markers good predictor of response to neurogen chemotherapy. That's it. But that wouldn't have been a, a, I mean, an exciting article to read. And as we were finishing the results section, we found we are finding a good correlation of toxicity. Now, it may sound like common sense. What is effective would also produce toxicity. If there are side effects, there are effects. Chemotherapy acts on rapidly multiplying cells, these cancer cells, so it'll also act on rapidly multiplying normal cells, bone marrow cells, hair, follicles, GIT. So there's nothing new in it. There's no rocket science. But did anybody quantify it? No. So this we took, I took as a poster to the SARC Oncology meeting. And I told my postgraduate, if people laugh at your poster, don't worry. I'm sitting in my session, come and tell me the question they have. They all went through and one of the editors actually got interested in it. And he was the editor, he was a Japanese gentleman. He said, I want this article if you could write it. We quantified the hair loss, then we quantified the vomiting. We organized it, and then toxicity became the reason why we did it. And these two articles, the, these are two editorials that I did. It's nothing to show. You, would, you can read them all on PubMed. Can you bet on pet in cancer? It just to make it interesting for somebody to read. Because pet scan has issues in this part of the world because of tuberculosis. So you can't bet on it all the time. You get false positives. Now, the article, I could have easily written how sensitive is PET in India? But that didn't really catch my attention or attract. I, did. I just looked at it as uh, an editor myself. Can you bet on PET in cancer? It has a huge number of reads. And I mean, it's one of the hit, well, maximum hits. It's a very, it's a one page write up. And at the bottom, why the resistance? Minimally invasive pancre pancreatic or duodenectomy. Now this was, to, uh, this was to write about minimally invasive surgery is good enough for Whipple's procedure. We are re resisting from it, including yours truly, because we consider this a tiger's own country, and we are tiger surgeons, all of us think that way, and we don't want to do minimal invasive surgery. So the title came, Saving the Patient from the Tigers. So it has nothing to do with tigers that you know, but it will become interesting. So make your writing flow and resonate. People will read only if you they find it interesting. Because even today, remember, as an editor, I can tell you, it is all, journal is also a magazine. How do you read? Why do you read a magazine? You read, you buy it. Why? It has some information. It has some good pictures. It has some good spice. It has some good gossip. It has some good letters. And the journal is no different. It's just scientific gossip, scientific spice, scientific material, and scientific pictures. Surgery in our case. So the papers written so that they flow and resonate can only happen if you're enjoying what you're doing. It'll happen over a period of time. And friends, 
never worry about rejection. I must share with you my experience of my first paper. It was on tuberculosis of appendix. I was the resident. I walked up to my mentor, told me, it's a good paper. Why don't you write it? I wrote it and I sent it to Indian Journal of Surgery. Those days, it was not online, so it had to go by a mule mail where you have to send 15 copies. It will take days to reach, and then you won't hear from there at all, something that we changed as I took over. Actually, it will take days for the report, report to come back, and then it came back with a very nasty statement, which said, what a rubbish. It makes no sense. It's so common. Why have you sent it? I was so dejected. I took it to my mentor and I said, I'm never going to write again. He said, no, you've done a mistake. Send it to the best journal that you can think of and get the best comments from there. Even if it is rejected, you'll get good feedback. And based on that, you can improve your article. I'll tell you what happened. I sent it to British Journal of Surgery, the same old Royal Air Mail. It went and in a 15 days, it came back with a Royal Mail. So it was a thick packet. I thought again rejected. So I didn't open it. And I kept it in my temple. I didn't see, see it for a while. I would avoid it because I was wondering what it would be. One day I opened it up with a lot of courage and it showed not a bad case report. Please add these things, correct this, make a picture better, better, et cetera, et cetera. I was super elated. And Indian Journal of Surgery rejected, but British Journal of Surgery accepted. I was editor-in-chief of Indian Journal of Surgery for so long. And I can tell you, it can happen to the best of papers. I'm not saying mine was the best, but if, that is what I spoke to all my uh, reviewers, please write back some comments, give them a feedback, don't be nasty. Any, everything that they write is worth it. More likely to influence the reader and editors. Now, please use the word processors effectively. Always say what you write and back up your work religiously. Not need, don't need exotic features, but you must know the basic computers. All of us have learned. The younger colleagues today are living in the era of um, information boom, which is a dangerous thing because the Dr. Google gives you information that you may get totally confused about. And you, shouldn't, you should have a good filter, which is what training is all about. And that's where we have a Gurukul group. We have a, nearly 5,000 plus students who attend it. We have PG master classes running every year. We do that. Now, Scope I did for eight years. Now I do Gurukul Khan rather. And it is the same uh, logic. You must expose them to this early. Need not use the exotic features, learn basic options and don't need to use statistical packages. They're very good and you can actually learn it. It's not tough. tough. Lastly, please take the editorial comments seriously. The he editor and the reviewers, they have invested his time, their time to improve the quality of your own writing. So respect their investment. They don't get paid for it. It's an honorary job for all you know. I'm not talking about those airy fairy journals where you pay for publication. That, that, that's, that's not recommended also, and I won't recommend also. For promotions, people do that today, but that's sad. You should write and send it to good PubMed index journals. It will be accepted someday. Don't lose your heart. But remember, rejection is a sales tax you pay for publication. Initially, out of 100 that I would write, 95 would get rejected. Only five would succeed. But now it's just the other way around. It has happened over a period of time. So take it as a sales tax, respect the investment and change it. Now, lastly, importantly, before I go to presentation preparation, which is very short, ethics in writing is very important. We are catching lots of cases, four cases in Indian Journal of Surgery, where we have to catch them for plagiarism. This is extremely, extremely, extremely important. And I'll request your attention for this, for the sake of your students and also for you. It is derived from the word ethos, which means character. Ethics in writing is mandatory. The basic issues that you find are in red, FFP, it's not fresh frozen plasma, fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. These are three things which are counted as data fraud, and you can be punished severely. Some people, some authors have been banned for life. They cannot write. And you think it's easy? No. Nowadays, getting information has become very easy. Sending articles to journals has become easy. Electronics have helped. But do you know plagiarism is also, the catching plagiarism has also become easy because they also have a software now. I authenticate and there's so many. Failure to publish is the reason. Duplicate publication, salami slicing, I'll touch them. Conflict of interest, the boss asks the postgraduate to publish and then PG disappears, he publishes in another name. There are authorship issues. 
not complying with legal issue, not retracting a wrong paper. Once it has been labeled as wrong, retract it in time because to accept your mistake can save you. We had to reject, we had to ban this gentleman who had published, I had published that article, then the complaint came three years later, we have an ethical committee where we rejected it. There are a few interesting stories that you should know, which will make you understand. Darwin, after writing, uh, getting his data of, on origin of species, did not publish it for nearly 20 years. Do you know that? Why? Nobody knows. It's a myth or a reality. I don't say, I, don't, I won't say 20 years. Maybe I'm wrong. Some years he did not. One was the fear of church, because church was very strong that those days. So he did, did not want to tell uh, that he's against church, because those days you could be banished. Second was, people say, it was the fear of his wife, which is, uh, his wife was a very, very strong uh, um, uh, Catholic Christian, so she would not let him publish it. But he delayed it, which is not correct. The delay is also considered some kind of a ill conduct because you're denying information to people. Information does not belong to you. Even if you discover something, it's called discover. And it's also called research. You are again finding it. It was already there. The world was here before we came. Do you know that? So there's nothing to find. It's already there. The Shakespeare's A Brief Discourse of Rebellion and Rebels. I'll recommend that young, everybody should read it. Lots of plays of Shakespeare. We rate him as one of the all-time great um, li I mean, literature that you read is Shakespeare. But a lot of his stories were out of one um, uh, I mean, some manuscripts which are found later on. And you'll find it interesting. This was the gentleman whose name was George North, working in the court of Queen Elizabeth. And ambassador, sorry, ambassador to Sweden. Uh, and actually, it was his stories. He wrote Richard III, King Lear, which was copied. This is the book, if you're interested, where you can actually read a newly uncovered manuscript source for Shakespeare's plays. So it was not original plays of Shakespeare. So that's something important to find out. And the very important one, which you all are very familiar with, is the Watson Crick model, which where, for which they were given Nobel Prize. It is believed that it was written by, it was her model. She was uh, working closely with them. They were in the next uh, desk. And basically, Watson and Crick, uh, they watched over, over the, uh, the barrier about her work and she went on a holiday before she could publish it. So they kind of stole it and published it. This is what you can read, this came in the Guardian. So she's the one who did the Watson Crick thing, which is something to read. Now, therefore, there are strict guidelines now and you cannot cheat. Accuracy and honesty is mandatory prerequisite. What is wrong with fraud? It damages reputation. Author institution field puts patients at risk of a wrong research. You read a lot about the the use of uh, chloroquine for COVID recently and hydroxychloroquine, you know about it. That will be counted as research misconduct. This corruption in research affects patient care. And this is plagiarism, which we all should know what is plagiarism. It is derived out of Latin, which means to kidnap. And this is the definition. That is you copying down somebody's work. And you'll be very surprised that many times you are doing it without knowing. And you're not at fault. And it's often very mild, subtle uh, uh, issues, which you don't even know. The types are many. First is the commonest one, plagiarism of ideas. I'll give you a very good, good example of that. The PG's thesis, mentor and mentee relationship. But you get an idea out of that and you do a publication of a different nature. A rejected article by the reviewers. Sometimes they kidnap that idea and they give that thesis to their postgraduate or their, they do the publishing. That's plagiarism of ideas. Please pay attention to this last part. Even if we are at the brink of finishing it, it's an important part of your the today's talk. As long as the sources are aptly acknowledged, it can be considered fair play to a degree. Direct plagiarism is word for word plagiarism. Please understand it is very common. And you see it in thesis of your postgraduate study commonly, especially in our university, we have to provide a certificate that we have checked it with I authenticate and there's no plagiarism. It is considered a serious offense today. You can, you know, plagiarism is easy now. But detection is even easier because I can use a software which I could not use earlier. Mosaic plagiarism, where you, what do you do? You read something. This is a definition given by American Medical Association. 
what does the plagiarist do here? It, he intertwines his own ideas and opinions with those of the original author, creates a confused plagiar plagiarized mass. This is called mosaic because you're creating a, a kind of, a, you know, you read something and then you build something around it. It's a mosaic pattern. You kind of camouflage your cheating. Such is dangerous. There is nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact, friends. You think it's obvious that I don't do it, but that's very deceptive. It is something that you would have to see. Self-plagiarism, you would be surprised. I have to mention my reference also if I say I did this. Stealing one's own work. It's a controversial, whether it's a scientific misconduct or not, but it is considered plagiarism. It's called self-plagiarism. Reader expects to read original something and you're violating such expectations by reproducing the same thing. What else does it do? It will create some kind of duplication. So it is not good. Disclose. And this is salami slicing, which you hear every day. What is it? You split your paper into four parts. I told you, I could have done toxicity separately, apoptotic markers separately, and the other responses separately. That's called salami slicing. What's wrong with that? I've done the work, so what's, my, what's your problem? The problem is, when you report the clinical trials, there is a consort, consolidated standards of reporting trials checklist, where you, do, you just take into account various trials. Your trial will get duplicated, which would mean we'll get a wrong result. And actually, this has been checked out of the PubMed. There are 957 results. People have actually split their own publication into various parts. And you can translate a Chinese article into English, if you're a Chinese, or you read a French article and convert it into English. There's a guideline for that now, you cannot do it. How much overlap is permitted? You must know this, it'll interest you. You're sending chapters to books, you're writing articles. Overlap of more than one third of the material is considered a serious offense. The others you can correct it. This is World Association of Medical Editors. I'm not suggesting you do it, should not do it. You know, they, this is a retraction of papers. More than 700 papers from PubMed have been retracted in the last few years. And please watch this slide carefully. There was none before 1990. What does that mean? Because there was no way to find it. You could, many people did what? They published a published article of 1960, which was tuberculosis on something or some fact, and you put it together, put it again. That's, that's you can see the numbers increasing now. Now, I, last part of my talk, which is, uh, which Dr. Bora has put maybe at the end, is making a presentation. I'll just tell you my way of doing it, which is not the only way of doing it, because there's no one way of doing it. You all do it already, so I have nothing to teach you. I'll just share with you, how do I do it? I've maintained that pattern throughout in my PPTs. So if you're following those PPTs, most of the questions would be answered. How do I go about making my presentation? Know the subject. There's no shortcut to that. Don't start on a PPT. First, write down what you know about the subject. Get your information right. Make a spider diagram. I'm going to talk around these things and about these things. There are two parts to it. About and around. Don't be around. And don't just be about. That won't be interesting. Develop a theme after that. And use a KISS approach. Keep it simple and safe or keep it simple and stupid. Don't try to write unnecessary things. Don't make it look too exotic. Don't make it look like out of the world presentation. The people who are listening are the people who talk. They're the same people. Listing the key concepts and points to convey, preferably in bullets. I have not yet started preparing. I'm just listing them. Then think about the ways of illustrating the key points. You've got the key points. What do, you, what do I do now? Now there, I put those down, down as bullets. These are my key points. And I'll go about talking basically about these points. One slide per minute, four key points in 45 minutes if I have to take home. Beyond that, I need to be clever to push it. I don't stick to this formula ever, but I'm suggesting a bottom line. You can build around it. Don't have 10 slides in a minute and don't have, you know, uh, uh, more time for it. I mean, this is one way of looking at it. The time and effort, don't think you'll prepare it overnight. Never do that, it'll be wrong. 
it's a very nice code and I like it by Mark Twain. It usually takes me more than three weeks to prepare a good impromptu speech. So for an impromptu speech, which is supposed to be spontaneous, he will take three weeks. And if you make your presentation in one day, especially for the postgraduates, don't copy it down to the Google and present it. It'll never make you develop that skill. You'll have to make your mistakes, friend. I mean, there are no mistakes in life. They're only lessons. And if you repeat a mistake, it's your decision. So then you structure your presentation. I would structure my presentation like this. This is how I do it. Opening. What is it that I'm going to tell the audience? Opening. What am I going to tell? Body is about telling them. So the part two is telling them. And summary is telling what one has told them. Because to keep, uh, this is a, there's a scientific research on it, to keep somebody's attention for beyond 15 minutes, you need to have something exciting happening. Otherwise, why should he listen? He has to find something for himself in that. So in the summary is very, very important. Then there is a 10, 20, 30 rule, which is very, very useful for making a presentation. I don't stick to it firmly, but it's a yardstick. 10 slides for a 20 minute presentation. No font should be smaller than 13 points. Never. Don't make a small font. All fonts you saw in my presentation, even if the number of slides would increase, I will do them in the same time. Reason is font size should be large, it's visible. The other rule is 166 rule. People like it, so I put it that way. Only one idea per slide. Don't put two. At most, use six bullet points. And maximum six words per bullet point. So one, six, six, 10, 20, 30. Now, when you have decided you've got a PPT ready, then some smarter people use those special effects. And with MacBook today, you have so many. The words flying on from Northeast to Southeast, then the one coming up from South to North, then the one coming from West to East, it's totally nuisance it doesn't really make any sense to anybody. People who have come to listen to what you're saying, they don't want to read it all, otherwise they can read it at home. Actually serving the dish is the ultimate part of the whole story. The recipe is ready, the pudding is ready. Now, do not bring it in style to the extent that the eating is gone. Can get boring and can be a nuisance. Can distract audience into reading what you've written on the wall. They should be listening to you. That's the idea of presentation. It should not be that they read it because they can always read it in the you know in the book. Advantages: sometimes there's some special effects. Very sometimes, very very few. I don't use them ever, but some people use to a good effect. They bring in an arrow to effectively cover it, and it can actually be used sparingly. Slide designs. I like to use white and black versus a little bit of color, but not colorful, because there's no point making a scientific presentation with a whole lot of owls and birds flying around. It doesn't make any sense. You're simply trying to confuse the, 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 the audience. That is, you don't want him to read. You want him to hear something else. Medical presentations and the YouTube talks about presentation. I'm especially warning you. If when you watch the YouTube talks, most of them are for the management trainees or people who are into business, they need it. But for medical presentation and scientific presentation, you need the material there, short and sweet. Like I, I said, kiss earlier, keep it simple and safe. Keep it simple and stupid. There is no point trying to make it extravagant. Finally, friends, as I come to the close, there is no one way of doing it. When I said this, these are available. When I said this, these are available. When I said this, these are available. This is where it makes all the difference. It's a beautiful quote. To be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you into something else is the greatest accomplishment. Don't worry about how good is your English. Don't worry about how much time you have convey your message. Importantly, stick to the time and stick to your slides so that you can make a difference. Importantly, they have come to listen to something which can contribute to what they already know. 
as I said in the beginning, most of us know it. It's just that you need to reinforce what they don't know. It's never too late to learn. And importantly, enjoy your presentation. And don't be in a denial. Don't think you are already done. I have done it. I have been a poor professor for 40 years. So how does it matter? You could be there for 90 years. You could be doing the same silly mistakes. Or you could be just beginning. And you will, every stage, till the time you're living, you are learning. And as long as you're learning, you're living. Now, this is a, of course, George Bush. I don't care what you think George said. My paper is dynamic and stimulating. So to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, I just talked to you about how I look at it. You can look at it differently. These are just the guidelines. They are the roadmap. The journey is yours. Most importantly, do what you enjoy doing. If you don't enjoy it, you can't do it for too long. And I'm sure you will enjoy writing and start writing. As I conclude, I will request you to start writing from letter to editor if you're not written ever. That's the easiest way to start. Most of my postgraduates do that. I teach them. Write a letter in response to any article. It's the easiest thing to do. Once you write it, it's wonderful to see your writing on the wall. Publish and flourish. Thank you very much, Assam chapter, and thank you all very much for listening so patiently. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, what a talk. Professor Chintamani, Dr. Ganguly here. Wonderful to hear you. Thank you so much, Dr. Very nice. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chintamani. Uh, Is there this, any it gives me a spell on me. So I request the participants to take part in the discussion. If you have got any query or you have got any comment, you can ask to Dr. Sintamani. He's asked. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sintamani. This is a, one of the best, I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> presentation that I heard on how to present as well as how to write a paper. So my question this year is about references. So we have not said about references. But some people ask me whether it is, I mean, it is to be used, particularly those papers who are accepted, but not published, whether that reference can be used or not in, a, in an article. What is your opinion? I, I, request, I, I, I request Dr. Uh, uh, Deepak to introduce yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dr. Deepak Kumar Sarma, Professor of Surgery, as well as HOD of Emergency Medicine. So, this, I was uh, editor of JASA, Journal of Essential Science, for two years. Yes. Just, so that question came to me, actually, and we solved it. But what is your opinion? I, I mean, that's a wonderful question. And actually, thank you very much for your very kind words. Uh, well, the answer is what is not published, its reference can you use for a new article? The answer is obviously no. But you can always give a reference um, to what, um, what is close to it. So the answer to the question is no. And I'm sure you also did not allow that. Because actually the trouble today is um, which references are valid? PubMed, Google Scholar, or the PubMed Central? There's a lot of confusion about that. So my answer to that question and what I would follow is, as an editor-in-chief, PubMed and PubMed Central only. Otherwise, we open up a Pandora box. There will be so many articles which have been rejected. You can't use their references. Uh, actually, we told them that if it has been already accepted by the journal, and if he has the authentic paper that it has been published in the source, at the same time, he must get a permission, written permission from that particular person that it has been accepted. And he, will, he should also give a, I mean, writing. I'm sorry. So I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. I got your question now. So yeah. it has been accepted. It's not been rejected. Not rejected. It's been accepted, it's accepted, but not published. Not published. Oh, yes, absolutely. You are absolutely bang on. Yeah. This is the uh, the World Association of Medical Editors guideline that you will take permission from the editor in chief and also from the author both of that journal, and you can use that reference. Sorry, I got your question now. Thank you so much. There are a few more questions coming up. How many actually? How many references are needed for a, I mean, original scientific article or a review article? Because there are different there, is, there are differences amongst the journals. Some people say it is 30, some people say 50. So is there any guidelines so that we can implement it in, in, in a uniform manner? But Sarma, it's again a very good question for the sake of postgraduate especially. Hello, hello, 
whenever we are in doubt bmj guidelines are the best yeah. and uh, bmj guidelines say you can go up to 50 and i think 50 are more than you need uh, and uh, usually in 50 you can always put cross references only about 10 or 15 others can be straight references and in indian general of surgery we allow up to 40 which can be 50 it's flexible but to have more than 50 is like having too many except i'm giving you a reason for that meta analysis and where we have no choice where the authors numbers are the also will be more than 25 maybe 30 there you may have more uh, references but otherwise in a classical review article which you rightly mentioned we would not allow more than 50 So there is one more question coming up in references. That is, suppose in many references in the abbreviation of those journals, and some I mean journals they we do not want abbreviation because we do not know the name of those journals. So we told them you better follow PubMed. If it is in a PubMed, so you give the I mean short journal. If it is not in a PubMed, you give the full full name of the journal. Is it correct? Brilliant. Actually, what I would suggest to them further is there is always a um, e format of the text full text when they have full text click uh, click every full text is now it is mandatory for them even open access to mention the citation which should be used for cross referencing so it is available it's just yeah. that they pick it up from the pubmed and some journals you're right don't allow those uh, abbreviations but there is a recommended abbreviation which is available when it's yeah. a pubmed journal then there's no problem otherwise it can be an issue and so there is one more question coming up about references that is your doi but is it mandatory to i mean it is, it is not required every, no? not no, required it, everyone, no it is not required because it is nothing to do with when you i mean it you know what it's about it's not about uh, the this most the term has come into use because of the open access and yeah 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 access. so um, it is not necessary you don't have to mention. excuse Thank me you. sir yes please dr yes. kundan from delhi yes dr kundan sir uh, how uh, should how do we decide in which jour journal we should send our publication and what uh, what that does impact factor really denotes okay thank you uh, the question is uh, how do you decide which journal to write to which i think i covered that in the initial part of my presentation you should first of all find out what's your article about suppose i'll give you an example my article is about fishery nano now i can publish it in a journal surgery journal colorectal journal i can mention it i can publish it in you know some journals which are medicine and surgery journals then some journals which are post graduate medical journals so there are places where you can search that's number one number two as i mentioned in my talk it's good to read the journal uh, i mean read the latest um, toc which is table of contents and find out what kind of articles are there and read one of those articles to see what is it that they prefer to uh, you know uh, uh, find in their uh, journal so that's one way of doing it when you come to impact factor impact factor is calculated roughly based on how many times an article gets cited in other journals and what is their impact factor to suppose uh, my article gets referenced in we get we get those these days with the with the internet boom you immediately get a uh, information that your so and so article has been referenced in so and so journal and these days all of you get that idea now based on how frequently a journal's articles get cross referenced in other journals it gets a impact factor impact factor of um, good journals like british journal of surgery in fact new new england journal of medicine is very high and some physics journals the, there is a journal nature they are very high 15 14 so this is basically indicating that so the, the how frequently the articles from that journal get cross referenced which actually shows the quality thank you is thank there, you so much sir thank you so much is there any question or is uh, there any... there's a question sir yes uh, there is a question by uh, from uh, ps i i really don't know who is he so he is saying that is there any significance of equating authors in Can I read it in the chat box? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you can. Yes, sir. There are two. Uh, uh, there are two questions. One is, PGs leave after MS thesis is written later by the guide as a paper after three years. In this case, should the guide or the PG be the first author? Yes, sir. Now, uh, see, uh, 
the uh, the question is of ethics and as a post graduate don't take credit for it and as a post graduate learn to bow before your guru he has made you do it you are not born with that information so that thought should not come to your mind i am not trying to pull you down don't feel bad about it i know these days we grow differently but the first thing is if i was a post graduate student and if my guide was to write the paper i would never even ask him where is my name in it but it could have changed today and that's why you're asking a question and i won't say no to your question i would look at the kind of work that that post graduate has done many factors would come into play and at some point he will become a first author to become a first author is not an ornament you're carrying you will be answerable to all the questions that come later on you will be completely saying i did not know my guide did it you did not get a particular facility you copied it from somewhere guide will take care of it so he is the one who is responsible importantly if he thinks it's right and if he thinks it's proper let him take that decision there is nothing like who should be the first author what do i do what others do what professor bora would do what professor deepak kumar would do would depend on how their attitude toward the post graduates is which is totally dependent on who is the post graduate so there is no one answer to it it is not a right it is something that you should consider as a blessing of your mentor to you believe in mentor mentee relationship i still believe in it that's the only way to go forward otherwise you maybe you can put your name as first author but you would never write anything that's no not the right way to grow don't i'm sorry i gave you a long answer but that brought me emotionally into it you should be simply happy that you your thesis saw the light of the day and it got published also don't you he you owe it to him completely he got it done he is the one who guided you that's why you call him a guide so what's your answer to the guide being there in front of you will you go ahead of him or you'll follow him okay the so, next question to yeah, you yeah i i think i think there is a basic question here that is guideline by bmz they have said so first author is the author who has actually kept i mean visualized the idea and he has given the whole plan it is a it is a i mean thesis guide who is giving the whole idea and whole whole process and so he should but i i wanted here. to i wanted to come to that part second yeah. i yeah. first wanted to tell them the basic ethos of yeah. the teacher student relationship and coming to uh, yeah. the guidelines yeah yeah now the guidelines in the in the words that you understand the uh, the guidelines are who conceives it there is a there is a word called conception did you conceive your thesis if you did you deserve it if you did not he is the one who will decide he can give you that it's not a gift he is giving you it is his blessing remember it that way it will help you in future mm -hmm. second guideline is 80 to 90% of the work should be done by the first author which you can never do alone it is not possible you are just beginning to learn so don't take it as an offense both of us both all your teachers are trying to say there is nothing like who should be the first author you can be the first author many of my post graduates are first authors of the work they have done but not many or not all of them so that's about the question answer to that question uh there is one question uh, if you could read doctor sir yeah uh yes sir uh doctor sintamani i i am doctor das uh, yes sir uh, i have i have got uh, uh few queries number one in the beginning of the talk you said about the the randomized uh, study in surgery but it is so difficult to conduct a randomized study in surgical practice so what is your opinion number 2 the the same study i mean like regarding the plagiarism if the same topic is you know you do a study in up and the similar study we if we do in assam you will you call it plagiarism brilliant questions thank you the first part i covered <laughs> partly and uh, thank you for asking that question randomized control trials do you know most of the nobel prizes 
have not gone to randomized control trials. Nobody could have done a randomized control trial for many things that happened to us. Because it's not possible all the time. You cannot do what we call it the parachute trial. I gave that example. You draw 50 people with parachutes and 50 without parachutes just to find it out whether parachute functions. That's unethical. So laparoscopic cholecystectomy, we don't have a randomized control trial because even if you start it, it will be unethical to practice because we already know there are advantages of randomized uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So it is not only the fact that it is not feasible all the time, it's not advised all the time. But when you talk about the levels of evidence, you take a reference form only randomized control trials because you have to find the significance of what you've done. When you put it down to statistics, and you know there's a quote by Mark Twain, there are four types of lies, white lie, black lie, bloody lie, and statistics. So he said it because statistics can change anything look better or worse. There is, a, there is a problem with statistics, but you still need the right significance, the right answer at the end of it. I'm giving you an example. When randomized control trial is done, at least you're neutralizing all those confounding variables and you're doing, you're keeping only one variable, which is very hard to keep.